Will you please bow your head with me? It's amazing to think that we can bow our heads and we can speak with God. I'm just fascinated by who you are. Last night, I looked at this amazing moon that was shining outside, this big thing that's orbiting the earth in the same way that the earth is rotating, perfectly round almost. This object up there reminds us of space and all the things that you have given us. So light that you can walk outside without a light because of this light that you gave us. Then I wonder how big must the creator of all these things be? The one that the Bible tells me made the moon and the earth, but also the sun and everything else. And the guys who wrote this didn't even know about all the galaxies up there and black holes and all kinds of fun stuff. And you made it. In a way, I feel that we almost can't sit or stand. We need to be on our faces before you. Because how can a creature even step into the presence of a God this great? But we can. We can because you came to us in your word and in your son to tell us that even though you are this amazing God, you want to be involved and you want to be a part of our lives. That you call us by ni- name and that you, and yet you interact with us in such an amazing way is still a miracle to me. God that has time for small people on a very small planet in a sort of small galaxy. Our God. We thank you for this. But now we ask that as we live as your people, that you will speak to us through your word and help us grasp what it is that you would like us to be and to do, that some of who we are may reflect this amazing God that we have met in the word and through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. So, <clears throat> so if you turn into a motel, a questionable one, in the wrong side of town, and you open your bedroom door, you know that you can expect to see this. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Isn't that supposed to be how it is? No, you know, you will probably get this. That's, yeah, 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 being there, camping in an American uh, motel, yeah, that's the kind of thing. No, no, to find the bedroom you just saw, you probably need to go to a facility like this that you can actually find here on John Young and, and, and Orlando. So it's amazing that the out- outward appearance of a building or a hotel or a motel can in a way tell you what you can expect on the inside of it all. Today's topic, goodness gracious. Because of the goodness and the grace of God, you and I are special. And why are you special? Because the Bible tells me you are a temple of God. I'm not sure if you are excited now, but let's go and find out about this. Don't worry, the guys who heard this also said, ah, can't be true. Let's go and read this. Okay, I'm done with this slide. You have now seen the slide. I can go on. Right, go Okay, this one. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship is there between light and darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Biliar? Biliar is just a, um, a name for Satan, devil, right? Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God has been with idols, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God. 
and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean. Then I will welcome you and I will be your father, and you shall be my sons, my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Corinth AD 56. Las Vegas on steroids. Absolutely. Horrible place. Horrible. They were well known as the Las Vegas of that time. It was one of those places that you would go to to get away from everything, and I don't think everything stayed there. Oh, man, they, they, they just took it out to wherever they went. What made Corinth such a weird, crazy, immature, uh, uh, funny city was the fact that they had so many temples. You would find temples all over. Now, now forget that now for a moment. Temples all over the city. On all the high places, you would have these temples. You couldn't get away from them. You would see smoke rising because they had some kind of sacrifice. You could smell the incense. You would hear the music. You would hear the festivals. You would hear the laughter and the parties that they were having, having all around these temples because they had all these fascinating gods. These are some of the temples that were in Corinth when Paul wrote this letter. You had Aphrodite. Oh, the one of Valentine. It's just love, man, this goddess. She made sure that love was the thing in for everybody around it. Then there was Poseidon. You know about this guy. He was the guy that controlled the ocean and the waters and everything that was in the water and on top of the water. So you need to bring a sacrifice for Poseidon if you want to go sailing. Then there was Apollo. Oh, he worked hard. He was the guy with all his, uh, uh, he had horses and he had this carriage and he had to pull the sun from the east to the west every day. So poor Apollo, he worked really hard. But he was in control of a lot of things, and Apollo was a guy that was a little bit scary in some ways. Sometimes he was sort of the god of music, but then he was also the god of punishment. Then Hermes, he protected the thieves. He was the god of the evil, and the, and the, and the, and the guys that also were on this down layer of population, they also needed their God. So that was the God that helped them to deceit and to deceive and to do all these bad things. That was Hermes. And he could jump between the godly, godly world and the human world as he pleased, but he would always jump back as this sort of evil creature. And then Asclepius. That was the God of healing. So if you would still now look at the symbol of the, of the medical profession, there's the snake thing that's called around the staff. And that come, this comes from Asclepius. In their temples, you would find snakes, and you would find that. At some point, the stupid idea that if you surrounded people with snakes, then, you know, it could help you somewhat in your treatment, um, or you'll die. That's, that's all that will happen, probably. So I don't know, Ferdinand, did you guys get this now already to move on a little bit? I'm not sure. If you can read the stories of these gods, they were all, in a sense, related to one another. Most of them were family, all of this lot. But these stories were very much the same as human stories. These stories had to do with deceit. It had to do with immorality. It had to do with cheating. It had to do with lying. It had to do with stealing. It had to do with all kinds of immoral stuff that were going on in this God world. And their activities and their actions, all the bad things they were doing there had an influence on the people on the earth. That's what they believed. So for everything they did not understand, they created a type of God. So there was a God for the ocean because they didn't understand this water and the movement. There was a God for the sun and the moon and all these things because they did not understand this. But the stories of these gods were very much like human type stories. And you had to please them. So they will be okay with you and not punish you. And how do you please these gods? That's the most fascinating. By doing what's the most pleasurable to you. Eating, drinking. When Paul wrote the letter to the church in Corinth, there were more than a thousand prostitutes in the city where less than 3,000 people lived. A third prostitutes. Because all of these religions that were created were created by humans so they can have an excuse to do whatever they wanted to do. To provide for themselves the gratification and satis satisfaction that they wanted in life. So they designed around these temples and these stories and these myths they had, stuff that would serve them well. And to a small church, 
in the middle of Corinth. Paul now writes a letter and he says to these guys, hey, you guys are the temple of God. So I know when they read this, they said, ah, what's wrong with this guy? Look at the temples that surround us. How do you want us now to be a temple? But Paul reminds them already in his first statement of the temple that was still standing. At this point, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. And most of them knew about the temple in Jerusalem, even though it was quite a distance away from Corinth. And they knew that this temple was completely different for one reason only. You see, this temple did not tell the story of God's fighting with each other. This temple did not tell the story of God's trying to deceive the other one to get more property or more whatever power. This temple told the story of God's salvation actions in the lives of a human of the humans, of people. This temple was soaked in the promise of God. We made a covenant with Abraham and he said, I will be your God, you guys will be my people, and I will show my presence with you through the history of your people. Completely different from all the other stories that you will find in any pagan worship. The godly world and all their activities and nonsense. This one a God that is involved with humans, whose biggest story is the story of his activity in the lives of individuals and of a nation. Paul reminds them of this when he starts off in Corinthians and he talks about a temple. So I thought to myself, so what does this have to do with us? You know, we have one temple. That's the Mormon temple there on the mountain. On, on the hill, if you go here on the Popkin Island. Otherwise, there's not really that many temples around us that, that I know of. But as I thought about these temples in Corinth, I said to myself, you know, those temples were there because mankind, humankind, at that point created for them things that they elevated because all of these temples were sort of on the high hills, but they were things that they elevated in their lives to, to be important, so they spent time, energy, and effort and resources to go and worship there, to be able to get what they wanted for themselves in life. Sounds like 2017 to me, a little bit. You see, in the world that we now live, isn't it true that, in a sense, our, our world is, so that surrounds us tries to, to remind us constantly of the things that we have made, that we have created? And it doesn't mean that all of the things that we have made is wrong or bad. But the things that we have created, we have elevated, sadly, and that's wrong, we have elevated those things to such a high level that it takes mostly of many times, most of our time, most of our energy, most of our resources, and our attention, and we do not have time for God anymore. The real living God. So we are surrounded, like the people in Corinth, with all these distractions. Remember now, they would leave their houses, and on every hill you will find a temple and smoke and celebration and music and stuff. And as you leave your house and you turn on your radio, what do you hear? If you listen to 107.7 or 106.1 or 6 and 105.1, all these radio stations, what do you hear? Songs that tells you to live a lifestyle that's not godly. You know, when I work in my garage, the first thing I do when I walk in my garage, I turn on my radio. Don't listen to this big. That's my, where my, why my son knows all this old music that he listened when I was younger. Now, now, now I, I, yest, yesterday I was working in my garage, and I said to Louise, they play the same songs over and over again. What's wrong with this lot? But then I started to listen to the words, and I've done this now a while. Oh, man. There's now one song that's extremely popular. How I like your body because we spent time last night in bed. I promise you they're not married. That's what you hear when you turn on your radio. What does the normal shows address on TV? Isn't it also a little bit immorality and all the wrong things? And it attracts us. Because in a sense, it gives us the excuse to do what they are doing because they're telling us that we could do this. Now we, the little bit of us that are here, are now called by God to be His temple in this world. What does it mean? Firstly, it means that God chooses to be in us. 
I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, when Solomon built his temple, God didn't need to show his, his presence, but he did. You can go and read the story in Kings. It's an amazing event. They all stood there, and then suddenly a cloud came down, and the cloud sort of filled the temple. God said, I do not live in this thing. I don't live in buildings that people make. But I want you guys to know that I'm here, that I'm present in this world. Then it says, and the people that stood there couldn't continue with their work, and they all fell on their faces because if you are in the presence of the mighty God, you, you want to be on your face. Now God comes to all of us, and he says, I want to move into your life. I really want to move in. Now, for most people, that's quite scary. I don't want God to be this close. He's going to see what I'm doing. He actually is seeing what you are doing. Don't you worry. If he's in or out, he knows what you are doing. But if God says, I, am, I made a decision to stay or to be with you, it's an awesome, awesome piece of grace. Of course, God could have chosen to do it differently. But God decides because you are so important and I'm so important to him that he wants to be in us and with us. The second thing, we need to tell God's salvation story. What made the temple of Jerusalem so different was the story. What Paul wanted the people in Corinth to, to know was that their lives and the way that they should live should be the story of God, the story of Christ. Um, you can turn on the ACs if they want to run. That'll be great. Thank you, um, Donnie. I, I, and I've said this. I, I work a little bit here at the YMCA, and, and a while ago, a young woman walked in, and she doesn't know the Lord. She hasn't been in church for a very long time since she was very small. And I thought to myself, and I'm a pastor, how should I now approach this girl sitting in front of me while she's a little bit telling me her story? Shall I now grab my Bible and read to her all the verses that she needs to know about salvation? Shall I now tell her about her own sin and her, you know, and that she needs God to be saved? And what must I do? I thought for a moment. And as she looked at me with a question, I decided to tell her a story. I said, the only thing I can offer you today is I can tell you why I believe. I know that you've got questions about God. I know you've got questions about the Bible. You, you just told this to me. You told me that your brother told you all kinds of weird stuff about religion and about the Bible, and it may be true in his world. But, but let me just tell you my story, why I believe. And I told her a story of how God got involved in my life when I was still younger and how I struggled with the same questions that she's struggling with. But how when I hung on to him, I discovered this amazing God that sometimes led me through wilderness experiences. A lot. Not only one, but many. Where I sometimes felt a little bit like Joseph. And I didn't say anything about Joseph because I don't know the story. Where I felt sometimes I was stuck in jail and the Lord forgot about me. But I continued to tell her the story of how Slowly through my life, I realized how God was there for me. And God is pushing and pulling me to where he wants me to be. And I said, you know what? That's what God is offering you. His story in your life. So if you ever are exposed to anyone out there that wants to talk to you about God, don't freak out and say, oh, I don't know what to do. Just tell that person your story and then you are temple. The temple of God reflects his story, not, not really our story, but his story, history, in our lives. Of course, the word his story is actually, if you combine it, is history. God's story in your life and in your world. That's what Paul asked of the people in Corinth. Crazy, wild, immature, interesting people. Hey, man, the only way we're going to change the city Tell them what God has done for you. That's all you need to do. The third one, be holy. What fellowship is there between light and darkness? You knew that was coming. We need to be different. We must be different. You see, I, I, I actually, I, I called Robin on Saturday or Friday, and I said, leave all the other scriptures. I had a list of scriptures that I wanted to read to you today, but that would take too long. 
Because in, in the two letters that Paul wrote to the congregation in Corinth, he, he time and time again reminds them that they are a temple. Time and time again says, remember now you are a temple. You are a temple. And most of the times he said this, he said, because God is in you and he chose to be in you, and you need to tell his story, your story needs to be different. You can't act like these fools act. You can't be the same. God wants you to be different. And the word holy means set, set apart, to be set to the side so that God can use you like a vessel in the, in the, in the temple. And therefore Paul comes and he says, what fellowship is there between light and darkness? How can you be pulling with the world in the same direction? There always will be friction between you and the world. If you and the world fit perfectly together, there's something wrong with you, not with the world. Do you hear me? If the world fits you like a glove perfectly, there's something wrong with you. It's impossible. Because our culture that we have as Christians will be different from the culture that the world has, except when the world is perfectly like the church. And I've not yet seen that, that happen. We believe in God. We believe in salvation. We believe in righteousness. We believe in grace. We believe in life. We believe that God wants us to act in a way that's appropriate, in a godly manner and way. God has specific rules for us as His Christian, as His children, how we should handle with sexuality, what we should do with our own sexuality, what we should do with finances, how I should take, take care of relationships around me, how I should address conflict and, and, and all kinds of um, um, uh, uh, arguments we have. The Bible talks about all of those things. We can do it in a world way or in God, God's way. Paul says, hey man, the only way that you will stand out between all these other rubbish temples that surround you is when you are so different that they say, what's wrong with you? You say, well, I'm so sorry, I'm different. I need to treat you with utmost respect because I believe in God. There's this story of, of this cop that pulled this woman over. And, and she got out. Oh, he got, got her. She didn't get out. And she said to him, what did I do wrong? He, he, said, he said, not really anything. She said, why did you pull me over? He said, well, well I saw you cut off someone. And it, you didn't really break the rules. And then when that guy honked at you, I saw how you reacted and what you said and what hand you used and everything. And then I saw on the back of your car a fish, so I thought your car was stolen. <laughs> you get it. And your value? Are you now a motel that's on the wrong side of town with questionable character, or are you a seven-star establishment? Seven star. There aren't seven stars, but it's so biblical to use the number seven, isn't it? A seven star establishment is, is someone that is different from the others. And why? Because our value. Our value. You are a temple of the only holy living God because Christ made you his temple and he paid for you and he gave you value when he died for you on the cross. And he says, therefore, Walk like someone out there that has been bought by God through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And remind yourself, you need to be different. Lastly, you are a temple. God's in you. In the New Bay membership class this morning, we talked about, talked about the need in the area that we live. We are, in a sense, very privileged that we are not exposed to that much poverty in the immediate area around our congregation. But there's one extreme need that I have found since I worked, moved here and lived and worked here. And that's the need of company. It's amazing how many people live in these neighborhoods of ours, in these big houses with these nice cars, and they are so lonely, so desperately lonely. I've seen countless of people that are married that have children. But when you sit and you talk to them and you look them in the eye and say, are you lonely? They, they always say yes. It is as if life is such a burden. It's so hard on people that, 
that it just drags people apart and their relationships turns from emotional ones to functional ones. And at the end of the day, you are the one that sits there surrounded with all these wonderful things and you die of loneliness. Even though you have people. And then there are so many people that there's no one that's really there to welcome them home when they open the front door. When the Lord comes and He tells us that we are His temple, He wants you to know that He lives in you. That you can talk to Him. That you can actually tell Him your stories. That when you lose a key, you can say, Lord, I can't find my key. Can you please help me find my keys? And I promise you, and, and I believe that the Lord may help you to find your keys. When you mislay your glasses, I, I, and it's really now getting a crisis, you know, you're starting to sweat now because you can't find your glasses. You can ask the Lord, Lord, help me, I need to get my glasses. And normally you can't find them because you can't see because your glasses are gone. <laughs> and the Lord may help you see to find your glasses, and, and I believe in that way in the Lord. The smallest thing I would ask him that I'm struggling with because that's what my children did when they were younger. When they were this big, they asked us everything. Everything. Did it make me angry? No, it made me so proud that my child came to me because of whatever they needed. Daddy, can you help me with this thing? <sighs> okay, yes, but let me help you. Gave you value. God doesn't need our value. But God wants you to know that he lives in you and he's there for you. This, oh, this holy Living God is with you in your house. And he cares for you. He said, I move in. That you may know that I will never leave you. And when you are in the darkness, the most darkest place in your life, and you feel that they have stolen the light at the end of the tunnel, it's really too dark. There's no light even anymore. The Lord says, I know I've been there. I remember how it felt when I was hanging on the cross and I couldn't see or feel or hear my dad. And I cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, my Lord, our Lord, where are you? I know how it feels to feel abandoned. I know how it feels to feel extremely lonely and your life is dark. But I've chosen to come and live with you because you believe in me. Because you became my people. You see, that's the answer. So, so how do you become a temple of God when you allow him to be with you because you said, I will be your person. I will be your people. I'll be your child. I'll be your follower. The congregation in Corinth struggled. My last slide. They struggled a bit. It was very difficult for them to find their identity in a world that was so hostile to Christianity. There was no building, no church with a steeple and a cross. They just met in a house somewhere, 12 of them, 14, maybe 30, I don't know. Surrounded with a world that was so different, that didn't care for them, didn't like them very much. At some point even told them they were doing weird things, as if they were doing weird things. Well, at the temples, you have no clue what was going on there. And they were at some point so afraid to leave their place and to be what God has called them to do because they were so different. But Paul wrote, wrote them two letters. He said, hang in there. You are called by the only holy living God to be a light of His glory, a light of His salvation in this town. That's where the living Lord wants you to be. So why are you here this morning in this church? Because God brought you here because he's got a task for you and for me. God knows that at some point you are going to interact with this world out there, with people that are completely lost and they do not even know this. And how can we help them discover who this God is? By being a temple, a living temple of Jesus Christ where we go by telling his story. By reminding myself He's in me because he chose to be me in me. To remind myself, he's with me wherever I go. But also reminding myself, because I'm not here for my own sake on this, on this earth. I'm here for him. Oh my, I need to be different. Different in my language. Different in my actions. Different in my thoughts. Different in everything I do. Because I reflect the only light there is.
the only hope there is, the only God that is, our God. Amen.